thinking about oops, just say got it, uh, ethical and respectful caring relationships with people with dementia, ethically sound healthcare decisions involving them, and recognizing the continuity between these two topics. In each, we should recognize the capacities of people with dementia to care about things and being in caring relationships. And in each, we should attend to their caregivers' capacities and vulnerabilities. I focus on people living with dementia rather than decisions about end of life. After defining a few terms, I outline three outsights, uh, insights from feminist care theory. And then I discuss a debate about healthcare for people with dementia before applying the insights I take from feminist care theory, both to it and to more broadly theorizing ethical interactions with them. So I speak of feminist care theory rather than care ethics because of the importance of both the ethical and political dimensions of care. On my interpretation, feminist care theory regards caring relationships and meeting needs for care as centrally but not uniquely important and argues for justly sharing burdens and benefits associated with care. Caring and can involve taking care of one another or oneself, borrowing from Daniel Engster. And Daniel, I often use your definition and, and always cite you, but now I actually get to cite you in your presence. Um, I understand this act of caring is seeking to meet someone's basic needs and maintain or recover their basic capacities. This is in keeping with work I've found persuasive by Soren Reeder and Benjamin okay. Fardell, that basic needs and capabilities approaches to thinking about justice can be compatible. Caring can also refer to the attitude Robin Dillon calls care respect. A variety of Stephen Darwell's recognition respect due to persons in virtue of their moral status. Care respect takes both care recipients' needs and their perspectives as morally significant. Now, taking care of someone ideally involves both the activity and the attitude. Uh, is that feedback? Is that anything that I'm doing right now? Nope. Okay. So caring about, by contrast, requires having something stably matter to a person. Autonomy has two dimensions, um, the ability to be self-determined, understanding options and making choices, and what I think of as a kind of bare bones authenticity, which requires simply that there are things that matter to us, so that autonomy is self-governance in the service of what we care about. To be autonomous, we need at a minimum self-understanding, understanding the world, and the ability to persist in pursuit of a goal. We also need hope of making progress towards our goal and trust in ourselves. Without hope, we'll lack will to act, and without, without self-trust, we can't make meaningful plans. I understand autonomy is relational with social context and interpersonal relationships, crucial to developing, maintaining, undermining, and recovering it. And just a little kind of footnote here, I'm, I'm aware of the recent criticisms of kind of some feminist theories of relational autonomy, and I take their point that we should not build oppression into autonomy, but um, I think that relational autonomy is still the kind of way to go. Okay. So mine is a weak substantive approach to autonomy as I recognize no direct constraints on what autonomous persons care about, but believe that not only skills and capacities associated with procedural theories of autonomy, but also help, um, hope and self-trust are required for it. Now dementia is not a single disease, but a decline in cognitive functions in areas such as memory, judgment, planning, language use, object recognition, and complex motor skills. Most dementias, but not all, involve memory impairment, and these losses undermine autonomy by reducing capacities and attitudes required for it. Dementia in particular can impair self-understanding, understanding of the world and one's place in it. This is often referred to as orientation, memory, and hence the ability to persist, judgment, and the abilities to plan, hope, and trust oneself. I draw upon three insights from feminist care theory in discussing caring for and respecting people with dementia. The first is the political nature of care, as Daniel Engster and Joan Tronto have stressed, uh, and I've already mentioned, we need to discuss the fair distribution of benefits and burdens associated with caring relationships, including how sex, age, race, ethnicity, social class, and global location impact who cares and who receives care. Asha Bandry, also here, gives a nuanced account of how people's social locations inequitably shape both. Uh, when it comes to, comes to dementia, women are overrepresented both as the caregivers of people with dementia and those needing such care. And this isn't actually just because uh, women tend to live longer um, lives than men do. There's a higher percentage of women over 70 who have dementia than men over 70. Similarly, uh, in terms of the impact of potential impact of oppression on, on members of their groups, older adults of color are more likely to need assistance in daily living than their white counterparts. And then when we turn to the direct care workforce in the United States, it's 86% female, 59% are people of color, and 26% were born outside the United States. This political context of care is why I focus in particular on paid caregivers in my um, discussion. 
The second insight is that the needs and capacities of both caregivers and care receivers must be kept in focus. Feminist care, care theorists like Tronto emphasize the danger of paternalism and the importance of attending to not only the needs, but also the perspective of the care receiver. Uma Narayan reminds us to attend to the differential vulnerabilities of those who give and provide care in a global context. Feminist care theorists like Eva Kate stress the importance of providing people with heavy caregiving responsibilities with support in meeting both their own needs and those of the people in their care. The third insight is that selves are relational with the capaci capacities we develop and sustain, deeply influenced by relationships, and that the capacity to be in a caring relationship, whether providing care, receiving it, or both, is morally important. So now I turn to the debate about healthcare decisions and people with dementia. It is pretty much 30 years old because in 1993 in Life's Dimension, uh, Dominion, sorry, Ronald Dworkin argues that individuals experiencing serious dementia should have their treatment determined by what is consistent with their former competent personality. He says that a quarter to half of everyone over 85 has serious dementia. Now, given that only 22% of people from 85 to 89 have any dementia at all, and only 33% of those over 90 have any degree of dementia, he must have believed that most people with dementia had serious dementia, which for him involves being conscious but not competent with no memories or sense of self. Now, Dworkin recognizes that those with serious dementia on his terms might still want to live and can still enjoy the satisfaction of what he terms experiential interests by having pleasurable experiences. However, he argues that a human life is distinctly valuable because of critical interests, which come with a standard of correctness and require a person to have a perspective on their entire life. Now, um, because persons with dementia often have significant memory loss, it is difficult for them to have often a perspective on their entire life. He gives examples of close relationships and care career contributions as of potential objects of critical interest and argues that people with serious dementia are closed off from both. So the important thing for me is that he thinks people with serious dementia are incapable of being in close relationships. Now for Dworkin, only a being with critical interests has full moral standing, and the only way to respect what he terms demented individuals is to respect their prior autonomy. When they haven't provided an advanced directive, their treatment, according to him, should reflect their prior critical interests. He then describes people who retain many valuable capacities as lacking critical interests and discusses Margot, an Alzheimer's patient who lives at home with a living carer, enjoys painting, disjointedly reading mystery novels, favorite snacks, visits from loved ones, and being held by them. Margot is, dis Margot is described by those interacting with her um, as one of the happiest people they know, but Dworkin claims, despite this, she has serious dementia and no critical interests. So if she had determined when still competent that she should not be treated for a serious illness if she became incompetent, then that, according to Dworkin, is the only way to respect her autonomy or to respect her. Dworkin's view that the precedent autonomy of the previously competent outweighs, in fact, is the only factor that matters in respect um, in comparison with the current preferences of the incompetent retains considerable currency. Emily Walsh, who rejects it, nonetheless calls it the received view. I label this the only precedent autonomy view of autonomy with dementia. Although influential, the view certainly has its critics. Rebecca Dresser is one of the earliest and most persistent. She argues that people with dementia can continue to have stable preferences and concerns, and their views should play a role in their medical care. She notes that people with dementia, even significant dementia, often have preferences for things like continuing, continuing old relationships and starting new ones and um, that people writing directives, advanced directives, may fail to appreciate that new preferences they form in the future could be entitled to respect. The most sustained and detailed philosophical criticism of Dworkin comes from Jaworska, who agrees with Dresser about the ongoing capacity of many people with dementia to maintain stable preferences, but goes further to argue that people with moderate dementia can still be autonomous. She first elaborated her critique in 1999, so almost um, 25 years ago. Uh, she argued then, and, and, and continues to maintain this, that Dworkin too sharply distinguishes between critical and experiential interests, that people with early and moderate dementia, at least, often still care deeply and stably about things, even if they lack a perspective of, on their life as a whole, and many still possess a degree of autonomy. I call this the continued partial autonomy view of persons with dementia. And as I said, this is what I expected to be guided by. Um, and I thought it would be really congenial with my own approach to thinking about children uh, and autonomy. Uh, but I found that I disagreed with it after all. So Jaworska bases full moral status and continued 
partial autonomy, and she argues that other people can assist the autonomy of people with dementia by helping shape their lives to reflect what they care about, even if the people with dementia neither request nor recognize the help as making this happen, and can neither direct their own lives to reflect what they care about nor provide direction to others to do so. Now, I certainly agree with Dresser and Jaworska that people with dementia should have their current cares and concerns shape their treatment. But I don't think this needs to involve their capacity for continued partial autonomy. Autonomy is about directing one's life to accord with one's cares and commitments. Because dementia typically impairs memory, judgment, attention, and orientation, it can really challenge the ability to direct one's life even with assistance. When we don't know where we are, what our options are, or what we were told a moment ago, we can certainly still care about things, but are severely compromised in our ability to make plans, provide guidance to others to assist us, or give them feedback to let them know whether they are or are not assisting our autonomy. So I think that instead of tying moral status to this uh, ongoing attenuated capacity for autonomy, um, I offer what I call the person's care view of people with dementia, which reflects the dual capacities of many of them to care about things and being in caring relationships. And for me, those capacities, rather than um, the, the ability for their autonomy to be assisted, is sufficient for full moral status. So my view is certainly closer to continued partial autonomy than only precedent autonomy, but it shifts emphasis from the capacities of people with dementia to be autonomous with assistance to what it means to have a good caring relationships with them. So people with dementia want the care they receive to reflect what they care about now, often more than their caregivers realize. Uh, this was confirmed on some, it's not very surprising finding, but was confirmed by Midler et al. in an article in 2019 based on research with them. So interactions with and care for them should reflect what they care about now, both when they deliberately change their minds and when they simply care about different things than before. There are times to be guided by what someone cared about before developing dementia, for instance, regarding the disposition of their property after the death. When a decision makes no material difference to the person with dementia, it makes sense to take the preferences of their previously competent self as authoritative. But when we interact with and care for people, especially in seeking to meet their basic needs, we should be guided by what they care about now. A focus on care recipients' current needs and perspectives is valuable not only for them, but also their caregivers, who should be empowered to interact with people with dementia as per certain currently worthy of respect and not dictated by the views of the person pre-dementia. So what difference might the person's care approach make in contrast to the continual partial autonomy approach? Uh, Jaworska frequently discusses in three different articles um, a man called Julian, a scientist who developed dementia. He was invited to make a speech at a banquet held to honor his academic contributions, and he wanted to give it. But his spouse, Anne, worried that his speech would be garbled. By listening to him, she learned what he considered important and gave the speech instead of him. Now, Jaworska presents the interaction between Julian and Anne as an instance of Anne assisting Julian's autonomy. I'm less sure. Family caregiving for people with dementia is demanding, and it's reasonable for caregivers like Anne to want to protect the memory others had of Julian. However, in reading about Anne's decision to override Julian's desire to speak at the banquet, I wondered if she could instead have followed Julian's speech with a speech of her own, articulating the views he failed to express, or perhaps Anne and Julian could have worked together on an audio or video recording of his speech, edited to make it clear what he was seeking to convey. This is a way that's generally recognized as respectful of people with dementia, which makes it more possible for them to organize their thoughts, pause, and review what they've said. This is because, as described, Julian wanted to give that speech, and maybe Anne was right about what he cared about most. But research demonstrates that care partners very often project their preferences onto those they care for. This should undermine confidence that family caregivers are always assisting someone's autonomy when they act contrary to what the person with dementia wants now. So the person's care approach accommodates insights from feminist care theory. Good, caring relationships take into account both parties' needs and capacities and require support from people and institutions outside those relationships. People providing care for individuals with dementia, whether unpaid family and friends or paid direct care workers, can be in caring relationships with them, often the only remaining uh, relationships of that sort available to people with dementia. So I think it's really important that caregivers are empowered to interact with people with dementia as they currently are. Whatever we might feel about the prospect of happy, happy Margot having her life curtailed because of the views of her previously competent self, the moral distress of paid care workers helping her live that happy life should be given weight, along with their insight into her current capacities. 
While we should want care to reflect the capacities of the person with dementia and what they care about now, I recognize that there are several reasons why past cares and values can still be important. First, the person with dementia may care about continuity with what they cared about before and may appreciate being reminded of what mattered to them then. Second, is didn't know them before to respond to care recipients as persons with ongoing value if they are informed about their past accomplishments and values by providing a fuller picture of their personhood that might be available through current encounters alone. Third, and this is perhaps most significant of all, but it can matter a great deal to people who fear that they might develop dementia, not to have their future lives conducted in a way that fails to reflect what they care about now. If people feel they will have no control over how their future with dementia will unfold, this could cause considerable distress. So I think um, that a de de default but defeasible assumption that past cares and values continue to be relevant is the most defensible approach to take. It recognizes that people with dementia will often have considerable continuity with their past when it comes to what matters to them, even when they can't express it. Past preferences and values can provide guidance to current caregivers if the care recipient cannot express through words or gestures what they care about now. People with dementia may take comfort from familiar activities, routines, and rituals. This default assumption recognizes that people from their past often want people to interact with a person with dementia in ways that reflect who they used to be, concerning especially matters like their religious practice, consumption of food, and romantic or sexual activities. Both people's caring now about their future life with dementia and their family and friends caring about continuity with past commitments gives reasons to provide options, for instance, for assisted living that enable people with dementia to share religious practices or patterns of food consumption with others, whether in a facility focused on members of their religious group or designed for vegetarians, or for providing a seat at the dining table with people with similar practices. However, the assumption of continuity between past and present cares should be defeasible. If the person with dementia makes it clear that what they care about in the present is not what used to matter them, current cares, I think, should be decisive. For instance, if a former life partner lo no longer lives with them and they've formed a new romantic attachment. In my longer paper, um, I examine a case wonderfully discussed by Monique Lenoir about Oscar, who used to be vegan and now just wants to eat the same food as the people around him in his communal living situation. Um, unfortunately, because of 20 minutes, um, I can't do so here. Instead, I'll make one further remark about how my approach um, can be applied to healthcare decisions, and then I'm going to discuss how both past and present can be relevant to what Hilda Lindemann calls holding a person with dementia in personhood. I'll describe ways persons with dementia can make contributions that matter to them, and I'll conclude with a brief diatribe against describing people with dementia as being in their second childhood. So, in the healthcare realm, I recommend that decision makers treat the views and values of the person before they develop dementia, whether developed in an advanced directive or as reconstructed by a substitute decision maker, as akin to one of the parties to be involved in shared decision making. So these views expressed or reconstructed should not be the lone voice, but should be taken into account, along with the views of the healthcare team about risks and benefits of different options, insights from paid and unpaid caregivers into the person with dementia's current interests and capacities and what they need to care for them well, and input from persons with dementia themselves. Some may be able to understand their options, and even those who cannot will often be able to indicate what they care about now, especially if asked in a variety of ways and given time to convey it. Both past and present are relevant to holding a person with dementia in personhood, a way of interacting intended to highlight to them and those around them that they are a person whose subjective point of view matters. The concept of holding someone with dementia in personhood is developed by Hilda, Hilda Lindemann uh, in a wonderful um, uh, kind of uh, article in 2002 and further elaborated. And her examples emphasize family and friends who knew the person before the onset of dementia, holding on to past ways of interacting as a way to insist on their personhood. Now, Rampala et al. interpret Lindemann as discussing hold a person with um, dementia in autonomy, but Linda doesn't talk about autonomy. Instead, she talks about holding someone in personhood. And I think the two should not be conflated. In the example she gives, a granddaughter paints her grandmother's nails the same shade of red the grandmother used to do um, for herself, and a son sits and has his mother scratch his head the way she has all her life. These are, to me, moving examples of holding someone in personhood, honoring who she was and what she can still do. 
Similarly, Francoise Bayless writes about holding her own mother in personhood after the onset of dementia by, by reminding her of her relationships to her spouse, children and grandchildren, of her past as a nurse and businesswoman, and the meaning she continues to have for the people who love her. Bayless tells us that her mother insists that she is still a person. Personhood and the capacity to respond to others as persons rather than autonomy is what I think we should foreground in caring relationships with people with dementia. In doing so, it is understandable that family members will put a heavy emphasis on the past of the person with dementia, but holding someone in personhood also needs to respond to and seek to find value in what remains. And I think uh, both Lindemann and Bayless gave examples of that. So when we focus on the current capacities of people with dementia, we should recognize that many of them can continue to make valuable contributions to their caring relationships by paying compliments, expressing gratitude, sharing hugs, listening to music together, making jokes, or offering hospitality in the form of easily provided items like an apple or a glass of water. When they can recognize their caregiver as a person treating with them with care, they should be expected and encouraged to do so. Care respect is person-focused, and so both caregivers and care receivers are equally entitled to it, as Dylan reminds us. This means that paid caregivers should be given time to relate to the people in their care as persons. Unfortunately, as Lenoir observes uh, in a 2009 article, paid caregivers' labor is often so regimented that, it, that tasks in caring for the bodies of care recipients leave them little to no opportunity to respond to them as people with minds, capacities, and a desire for relationship, which is bad for both givers and receivers of care. Now, earlier, I cited statistics from a recent report on the composition of the care workforce in America. That report also includes some quite wonderful quotes from some of those care workers. One of them, Dessaline Watkins, writes, quote, my relationships with my residents are multifaceted. Yes, I am their staff and my job is to support them, but I am also a mentor, a friend, and I provide guidance. The residents are also here for us. If I come to work and am not in the best mood, they make me feel better and are concerned for me as well, end quote. Kulix Vibinella, another care worker quoted in the report, describes receiving gratitude from the people in her care. Quote, our members appreciate the simple things we sometimes take for granted. When they tell me, thank you for the hug or thank you for smiling, I know I did something right to make them happy and that makes my day, end quote. So the paid caregivers in this report value positive, but also acknowledge difficult parts of their jobs, including low pay and low social respect for their work. I certainly don't mean to romanticize paid care work. Instead, I argued that in addition to increasing pay from public funds when private resources are unavailable and elevating respect for the skills involved in and value of paid care work for people with dementia, we should also provide funding for and structure practices that enable the formation of relationships characterized by care respect, a vital way of recognizing people with dementia as persons and one which is greatly valued by their caregivers. Now, even though not all people with dementia can articulate how they want to be treated, many can. Asawi McAvoy and Mansell quote some in an article from 2020 exploring what people with dementia thinks makes communication with them positive and meaningful. This is an example of conducting research with people with dementia rather than on them. The title of the article is a quote from one of the people with dementia participating in the research. The quote and the title is, it's nice to think that somebody's listening to me instead of saying, oh, shut up. The people with dementia in this study all experienced short-term memory loss and needed help with activities of daily life. Most experienced occasional orientation and had difficulty communicating. All appreciated others empowering their ability to communicate, emotional connection, yeah. shared laughter, and feeling heard. Many valued reminiscing with family caregivers and being reminded of the meaning events had for them in the past. So what they didn't like was feeling dismissed, unheard, or pressured to do what the other person wanted. In other words, what they experienced as valuable and not so valuable forms of interpersonal communication are what most people do. And don't worry, I'm almost at the end. <laughs> so I've described contributions people with dementia make to interpersonal relationships, but they can also make artistic contributions by working alongside caregivers and artists to produce collectively developed works of art. Now, the activities offered to people with dementia and in institutional care typically involve watching while someone else performs. But Anne Basting, an academic and artist who works with people with dementia, describes participatory drama, drama activities which provide meaningful opportunities for people with dementia to engage in art making. When asked what she thought about participating in the project, one person whose dementia was advanced responded, it is the last important thing I will do in my life. Dupuis? 
similarly describes people with dementia contributing to a communally created art project. Both they and their caregivers found that engagement in the arts project reminded them of the capacities of people with dementia to make valuable contributions to their communities. So I'll conclude by arguing against discounting the capacities of people with dementia by speaking to them as having regressed to infancy or early childhood. I imagine that most of my readers will have heard elderly people, and especially those with cognitive impairment who need help with tasks of daily living, described as being in their second childhood. However, even when adults need assistance of the kind provided to young children, this does not mean they are in their second childhood. Adults who have been treated with respect know what it is like to be disrespected. In interacting with people with dementia, we need to recognize who they are and not categorize them with children. This will include interacting with them as persons whose lives have shaped their expectations as to what it means to interact with someone respectfully. So thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Amy. That's, this is so interesting um, and there's so much to discuss. So let's start the queue. I will um, look for hands. So raise your hand using the raise hand function and we'll begin like that. Let me pull up the participant list here. Okay, okay, so we'll begin with Monique Lenoir and then um, people can raise their hands and I'll keep track of that. Hi, Monique. You're muted. Monique, you're muted now. Can you unmute? Yeah, I on camera, I on, yeah, got the video, but forgot the, the mute. But anyway, all right. So thank you so much, Amy. I really enjoyed the paper and I'll be emailing you more about this. Um, but uh, actually a film um, that is quite interesting is called Finding Penelope. It's 2014, it's a documentary, and it is this uh, theater troupe who went into a nursing home in Minnesota, I think, or anyway, the U.S., actually, where um, a, a nursing home for persons living with dementia. Uh, and it is really interesting uh, to see the interaction and, you know, the work sometimes is difficult and there are various um I guess, uh, stages of dementia, the persons living there, uh, but uh, their enthusiasm, right, to to actually be performing and the family was in, invited and they had a formal presentation. So that sort of leads me to my, my, my second point, which is Pia Contos' work. Do you know her? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she uh, discusses how uh, selfhood, so it's not autonomy, but still self embodied selfhood in Alzheimer's disease, basically, mm -hmm. is the title, Rethinking uh, Person-Centered Care. And she talks about, she discusses, she, she went and studied a nursing home around Toronto somewhere, and how the residents, even if they were not verbal, would certainly demonstrate uh, their preferences, you know, of how to dress. And, and she discusses the case of a, a woman who likes to, to wear a necklace and so on. And so these preferences are embodied. Um, and it points to the fact that, you know, someone like Dworkin is really emphasizing uh, the verbal capacity of individuals um, to signify their autonomy or even you know, their right to live to a certain extent. So that's that's a point I wanted to um, point out. And the, the other thing too is trying to understand the behavior of persons with, you know, uh, a certain type of dementia. And there's a really neat article called From Wandering to Wayfaring. And we tend to think that someone living with dementia is just walking around they're lost, they're disoriented. And the research um, that they did is to basically ask the person and to realize that um, the, the individual was uh, wanted to go to work, right? So walking was a way of being active, even if they weren't um, understanding that they weren't at work anymore and they, they it's been a long time since they were retired. But the, so these embodied actions 
sort of demonstrate a capacity for action and agency that we often dismiss because of our problematic, I guess, as you point out, uh, conceptions of dementia as somebody just not having these capacities anymore and not. So we're not looking further into the behavior. We just look at it and go, oh, you know, that's aggression. Well, what does that mean? Right. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> so 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 thank you so much, um, Monique. Um, uh, I completely agree with you. Uh, one of the theater projects that I was talking about was in the United States. Another one of them was in um, Canada. And I, I, I actually think this is like like a really valuable um, kind of form of um, allowing people to contribute to arts activities and not just, as I said, be passive spectators. And I uh, couldn't agree more with you that we often have to really try to interpret what people are seeking to achieve. And I regard um, the kind of some of your examples, like for instance, the desire to go to work is not just a sense of activity, but also a desire to make a contribution. Um, and so one of the reasons why I talked about um, kind of th that people with dementia can still express compliments is one of the people with dementia in my life was sort of talking about how they didn't feel that they were making important contributions anymore. Um, their their previous life was like they were definitely making them in a kind of way that was recognized and appreciated. And I was able to point out that they had a real skill at giving very personalized, much appreciated compliments to people. And um, and that's been one of the things that they've really kind of incorporated into kind of their new sense of self-worth. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for those those points. Okay, so we have a queue here. We have um, Daniel Langster next, then Naomi, then Amber, then and then I'm in the queue. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank, thanks, Amy. This is a, a great paper. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I like how you walk us through the, you know, from the Dworkin prior commitment to you to the um, the continued partial autonomy, and then and then to your perspective. And I really appreciate you talking about how uh, you thought you were going to end up on that continued partial autonomy view and then and then uh changed over and so so I'm very sympathetic to what you what you argue but I wanted to ask you um I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the Oscar example mm -hmm. because when I landed on that example I guess uh you know I, I, I our, our our views might still be the same but um I had a little bit more of a tug to some sort of prior commitment uh, view because uh, I was thinking um you know, you keep, uh, like, what if, you know, what if we reframe that and Oscar is, you know, um, Hindu or it has to do with, you know, he, he's Muslim or Jewish and, and everyone around him is eating pork or, you know, or Hindu and they're eating hamburger or something, you know, right? They, you know, and, and this is a very, uh, you know, a, a commitment that they've had for, you know, some 70 years of their life or something. And, and suddenly they find themselves, you know, uh, in, in a, you know, a community um, where a lot of people are eating hamburgers say and and uh this is this would go against their their previous religious beliefs and and uh even their beliefs about what really matters in you know in life for their uh you know for their reincarnation or their um salvation whatever it may be so so you talked a little bit you know you talked about religion and maybe trying to find ways to to put people into to assisted living uh situations where they'd be with people uh of their own religion or uh similar um a dietary preferences, but but uh, I I I just like to hear you talk a little bit more about you know what about the case of say a you know a woman who has been you know Hindu for all of her life and she ends up in the United States for the last ten years of her life and you know goes into say uh, you know some sort of assisted living where where uh, everyone is is uh, uh, eating you know in a way that say you know would be totally contrary to what she previously. Um, considered and, and I'll just also just one last little point I'll add here to the question I, I mean I was talking to my partner about this earlier today you know because because you know I was talking about this sort of example and then uh and then she was saying yeah but you know what if you you know what if you tell this you know this woman you know hey you're you know you're Hindu you don't you know you really haven't you know you you don't think it's right to eat beef and she says you know and she's kind of insistent like no I really want a hamburger you know I, I want to just do what everyone else so if you could just talk through some of those things, I'd be interested. Yeah, so so again, so this is Monique Lenoir's example, and she really kind of talks about it in a wonderfully sensitive way. Uh, and so I recommend her paper. But what uh, what I think is that, um, first of all, the, the most care homes are willing to accommodate um, people's dietary preferences, when especially when they're um, kind of 
deeply rooted in moral or religious beliefs. And Oscar, they were happy to serve him uh, vegan meals, but he wanted to eat what other people ate. Um, and, and I just think that it's important to understand this wasn't like him thinking, ooh, like, you know, hamburgers, yummy. This was like him thinking, I'm being singled out from the other people around me and, and, they're, and I'm not able to share with what they're sharing. So that's why that's why I suggested both that it could be really good to explore like kind of like, you know, care homes where it might be devoted to people who could have kind of similar preferences or like if you just you're like you're a minority and it's not available, like a table of people who might have because I think that it's not just about kind of like the taste of the food or and I I see that it's about like the social meaning that the food has. Um so I and I, I do think it's appropriate for people to kind of talk to Oscar as happened instead of, you know, you used to be vegan and used to be important. This is why you said you didn't want to eat food and then and see if reminding them um, of, of their past values might kind of like reinforce in them. OK, it's OK that I'm eating something different. Maybe they could even have the opportunity to say to other people, one meal a week, do you want to join me in what I'm eating? You know, so that there's kind of that. So it's a kind of social conversation around it. But even when it's traced to religion and not just to kind of like a strong moral view, um, this is often what prompts. I don't think that if you prompt the person and you remind them of the past and, um, you know, that you that that it's right to just sort of say, well, sorry, you want to eat what everyone else does. But in the past, this was your views. And so you have to now abide by your past determination. Like that's what I was trying to say. I think there's a lot of reasons to consider the past. And one of the things that Monique Huana points out is that when his vegan wife comes to, to visit Oscar, maybe he could be served like vegan meatballs that look like, you know, the meatballs that everyone else is eating. Because we also should respect kind of the the kind of the the views of the people from the past who want to maintain their ongoing relationship with someone. So I think it's really tricky, but I guess I would say that in the end, kind of adamant <laughs> refusal on the point of view of the person as to kind of like sticking with the past um, is something that I think should be respected. And I also think it could be difficult for caregivers. They're like, if, he's, if the, the person's like throwing, you know, tossing their food away and saying, why don't I get to eat what, to sort of say, sorry, no, this is what you used to want. So I'm going to feed you what you used to want. So I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's messy, but I do think, um, and I do think there's a role for someone's past preferences. And as I said, it can cause people present distress if they think in the future I might not stick with my religious um, preferences or my dietary preferences. And and so we should give weight to that. Um, but ultimately, I think that um, when it comes especially to meeting someone's kind of basic needs, um, I think I regard, regard this as both Oscar's social needs, like primarily his social needs, um, I think for me would be the most important. Sharing a meal with someone is sometimes one of the few ways in which you're truly still interacting with other people. And being singled out as being the person who does things differently could just be very, very uncomfortable and unpleasant for someone with respect to meeting their social needs. Okay, Naomi Shiman, you're next. Uh, hi, um, I really appreciate the, this approach and and the the points that you make. Um, the concern that I have, and you touch on this a bit, is around the relationship between um, respect and what Strassen calls the reactive attitudes, mm -hmm. and um, the idea of holding somebody responsible and calling them out on really bad behavior. And um, the particular sorts of things I have in mind are, um, I mean, my uh, I, my mother had dementia and lived in a, a care place near me, and my brother-in-law is dealing with it now. Um, with my mother, she became problematically and inappropriately highly critical of the people who were caring for her and would just sort of dress them down in, in ways that just creeped me out. And I so I did a lot of, you know, sort of urging her to respond differently, but also um, apologizing to the staff. And their response was, you don't need to apologize. We're used to it and we know that it's the disease and not the person. Um, with my brother-in-law, he's um, particularly unkind, to put it mildly, to my sister. And um, I will sometimes, you know, 
criticize him for that. But my sister deals with it a lot. And the um, the tension there, and thinking now of trying to help my sister in dealing with this, is to not get angry when he does something that had he done something like that in the past would have called for anger it's clearly inappropriate it's clearly hurtful blah blah um but not get angry on the grounds that he's not responsible and it is the disease but then that feels disrespectful it's not respecting him in the way of holding him to account for what he does and getting appropriately angry. And so that and that feels to her both just morally problematic because it feels disrespectful, but also like an incredible loss, mm -hmm. that a loss of an ability to in that way respect somebody she was used to respecting enormously. So so it's that sort of the appropriateness of those kinds of reactive attitudes and when it feels like it maybe is disrespectful to withhold um you know anger or criticism or pull back on expectations of decent behavior okay so so there's there's two things the the first and the easy and the not particularly philosophical one is that the coping strategies of people who are um receiving kind of this disrespect and abuse like if they if it's easier for them to sort of say they're, they're, I can't hold them responsible. I'm not going to get angry. I, I I understand that that might be what a person needs to do. And I do think it has a risk if you're not holding someone at all responsible for their disrespecting you for compromising your relationship. I don't, I don't think it means the person won't try to meet their basic needs anymore, but I think it could well mean that the person will give up on the possi possibility of kind of, of a caring attitude in the sense of care respect because they aren't any longer respecting the person. But even though I do think that kind of saying they're not responsible for what they do might have this negative spillover for caregivers who then there's a lesser extent of interacting with a person as a as a person, I think it may be a perfectly acceptable attitude for them to take and, and self-protective. Um, but I guess what I would say, because precisely because I think that um, caring relationships are so important, I do think it's worth just trying to see if you can bring the person with dementia to recognize the extent to which they are being disrespectful of someone else, it's hard because you, it, it can be painful to be reminded of your dependence upon somebody else. And so I wouldn't put this in terms of they're doing so much for you, therefore you have to be nice to them back. But I would try to put this in, look how respectfully they interact with you when they're dealing with you. And no matter what you, you know, and so don't, don't you think it would be valuable for you to, to kind of try a couple of simple things that you could do to respect them back? So I guess I think it's so important. It's worth struggling for kind of holding on to still the kind of re regarding the person as potentially still an appropriate target of reactive attitudes and potentially still someone who can direct a reactive attitudes appropriately towards others. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a kind of full answer, but that's that's where I would go. Okay, next we have um, Amber Knight. Great. Um, thank you so much, Amy, for this paper. I've been thinking a lot about what makes for a good caring relationship for people with dementia after reading your, your really interesting paper. Um, and I think you make a really compelling argument that healthcare decisions should be partially informed uh, by who the person was in the past and what their commitments were, but should also be responsive to who they are and what they care about now. Um, and as I was reading this, I thought there might be perhaps an opportunity for you to make a more um, forceful case, perhaps, for the desirability of collaborative care communities or care teams uh, to provide quality care for people with dementia, uh, to talk about perhaps the risks of entrusting a person's care to one person or a small number of people. So I could imagine, uh, you know, that someone that has a longstanding relationship with the individual with dementia would be more responsive to their prior preferences. Um, and maybe, a, you know, a paid caregiver who came on the scene kind of in the later stages of dementia would be more responsive or attuned to their current preferences and how that could be more of a collaborative 
process among caregivers to come to some sort of a a decision. And um, and you know, in talking about the theme of respect that you bring up, you know, how caregivers can respect each other. So I, I mentioned this as an example because um, with my my grandmother's care, my my mother and the paid caregiver sometimes were at odds with one another, as if they were. Um, advocating on behalf of two different versions of my grandmother, right? So, you know, people would be coming over for visits and my grandmother had historically been very vain and she always had her makeup done and was, you know, kind of done to the nines. And she didn't have those preferences after dementia. She could care less if she had a bra on, she could care less if her hair was done. And my mom wanted, you know, the caregiver to make sure that she, you know, kind of did her up the way that she thought she would have. And the the paid caregiver was like, you know, she doesn't care about any of that now. Just let her be. And so, how were they supposed to respect each other in those discussions about what Grandma Pat, you know, would have wanted? And so, anyhow, so I was just I was hoping I could hear a little bit more, not just about the care um, caregiver care recipient dyad, but kind of the broader care team and how they should interact with one another. Yeah. So that's, that's a really fascinating point. And I did actually say in like the long version of my paper that I thought paid caregivers often can have more insight into the current capacities and concerns of the person with dementia, because sometimes the, sometimes they just spend so much more time with them. And sometimes because, um, the person, the family caregiver or the kind of friend caregiver is, primarily concerned not just what the person was like in the past, but the, what their relationship with that person was like in the past as well, and trying to hold on to it. Um, and, and that's sort of a little bit what I was trying to say about like when you hold on to someone in personhood, it's really important that there's a balance between that respect for who they were and who they are now. And I do think that collaborative care teams are best, uh, are kind of most likely to have that happen. I also think collaborative care teams are really important because the demands of caring for someone with, with dementia, but depending upon um, the, 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 the needs for assistance can be really significant. So um, I... As I said, I, there was many ways in which I think there's a role for the past, but when, when a person, I think when the person with dementia really is able to convey that this is not what they want, like stop putting this makeup on me and brushing it away. And like, no, I, like, I, I'd rather, I, I'd rather spend more time with my friend than have, have my makeup on first and things like, I would, I would be very much guided by that. And I would also think as the person who's expected to do that, as the pay, paid caregiver who might be expected to actually use almost forms of coercion to make sure that the person who doesn't want to be dressed to the nines is dressed to the nine, I really think we need to consider how they would feel about doing all of that. So I would say if your mom who cares about that is able to do that sometimes before, visits, maybe before photos are taken for a family card, you know, then, and, and, and your grandma doesn't mind when she's doing it, then, you know, more power to her. But I would, I would um, tend to err on the side of let's, let's not um, impose our expectations on someone, even if the expectations we're imposing on them are what they previously would have imposed on themselves. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question and then I see that we have questions in the uh, um, chat as well. And actually I have two questions. I'll ask the first one um, and the second one is connected to some of the chat questions. So I'll save that for later. And I'll, I'll so I, I think it's a really attractive view overall and really, really interesting and very nuanced. Um, so I'll raise an objection uh, to kind of uh, clarify my understanding of the view and the case for it. So. You know, and the objection is about the sort of, um, well, basically the objection is, is this view too occurrent? You know, is it are, is there too much of an emphasis on the desires at a given, you know, time slice? Um, now, you know, and what is the, so what is the burden, sort of how substantial does a person's, um, or how, how enduring does their current care have to be to override the earlier, the earlier care or the earlier um, commitment? So, and I mean, I think you've been answering this in a way in terms of maybe procedural um, elements, you know, procedural guidelines, but I wonder, so I wonder if you can kind of respond to that, you know, as an objection. So the objection is that kind of the view seems too occurrent that, I mean, the person, may be changing what they care about 
And particularly when um, we're thinking about their relationships with others, you know, they might throw away a relationship with someone. Um, and if we take very seriously their, their occurrent desires and cares and concerns, then that person, you know, might kind of respond by leaving them alone out of respect for those desires. Okay, so so I guess I think that there's a difference between our occurrent desires and our continually stable um, cares and concerns that we might have in the case of dementia. And I do I think there's a reason for caring about someone's strongly held occurrent desires because we don't want to force things upon them if it's not necessary. Right. So if we if they don't want to eat anything at all um, or, you know, then maybe you still have to kind of use tricks of some sort or um, kind of be very firm about, no, you need to eat. Um, um, so so you may sometimes need to override someone's current desires and, and kind of and respecting their own health. They might want to leave the building and you're saying, I'm sorry, you can't leave the building right now. It's nighttime. It's very cold. You're not dressed for it. So I'm not saying that any current desire uh, kind of is something that has to be respected. Prima facie, we should care about current desires, mm -hmm. um, but I, but I do think there's that you can only tell if something is a stable care or uh, kind of concern for uh, if it's demonstrated in a pattern over time. And so um, I do think that uh, you you can only tell by like, checking up like people's current behavior, um, but that um, you would be looking for a kind of a pattern of that this is a, seems to be regularly something motivating their behavior. It seems to be regularly something they are shunning um, with words or gestures and so forth. So I don't think it's just about something that's um, manifested occurrently. Um, and I also think that there's a difference between, so I think in, in the, the paper, I talk about a person who they're trying to decide whether or not he should be discharged to home or into a kind of care facility. And, um, um, and he just says, I just want to go home. But he doesn't recognize that if he goes home, this is going to mean um, that his partner um, is going to be very significantly burdened. Um, and so I think that we would try to figure out what is it that he's wanting in wanting to go home, what is it that he's seeking to avoid? Um, does he understand what this would mean, like for him and for his caregivers? Um, and so I don't think it's just like that, the way that a person with dementia might put things might reflect their inaccurate understanding of what their possibilities are. Um, and so I'm not saying that it's always going to be the case that we're just trying to kind of like, okay, let's figure out how we can get you home. Um, I think we should try to figure out what is it that this person has showed us that they care about? Uh, what is it that they what they showed us that they're concerned about in, with respect to moving into an assisted living facility? What is it they would like to still have um, available to them that they think would be available to them at home? Um, so I'm not sure if that that kind of suggests, but I'm, I'm not saying that it's just a kind of a, a fleeting desire. Um, uh, but, but if it's a fleeting desire, then we would um, give some um, uh, weight to both their previous values and to looking to see whether their fleeting desire um, uh, is consistent. Um, like it's not just fleeting, but it's like repeatedly manifested. Um, so it's not the case that all fleeting desires would be given equal weight. So just to follow up um, quickly. So so is your view that there is a kind of um, some sense, some sort of a stable self that is the self of the person with dementia? So I do, no, no, if you mean it's the same self, like with, like from the onset of dementia to, to death? Well, no. yeah, like, so, so what is, you know, to, uh, how, like how stable does it have to be? How stable, how much of a pattern do we need? How much time, over how much time does it need to be fixed to count as um, something that can defeat the earlier um, cares and concerns and interests? Um, it would be really hard to say exactly, but it wouldn't just be whatever is expressed in a moment. Um, it would be something that would kind of manifest itself over, like, let's say, at least a week, right? Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and and um, Eva Kate has a question here in the chat, and Eva, do you want to um, ask it? And I think you have to unmute. You are, you're muted, Eva. Um, okay. Okay, there okay. we are. Yeah. <laughs> a, a, a ridiculous question occurred to me, uh, you know, I mean, 
we talk about uh, people with dementia changing their preferences, but we all change our preferences. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the reason for the change may be different, um, um, but, um, you know, we're, we're not, we're not one fixed person. We're an evolving person and a changing person. And so, um, you know, might come, um, you know, without dementia, I might decide after having been religious for quite a while that, you know what, I, I really, I really don't want to do that anymore. Or I don't want to put on makeup anymore, you know, whatever. Uh, so um, maybe we, you know, so what's the difference? I mean, what, you know, why is one so problematic? Um, because we think they don't know what they're talking about. Well, uh, in their own world, they may know what they're talking about, right? And another point about preferences and and um, I, I I was um, <clears throat> really taken by one caregiver of my mother, who um, managed to see in small things how the things she really cared about but could no longer do, execute, could manifest themselves. Mm -hmm. So for example, she was able to unlock her door in a way the caregiver wasn't able to. And she really you know, gave her a lot of uh, praise. And what that did for my mother was, um, reinforce what was really important was was a sense of our own efficacy mm -hmm. um and uh you know that's tied into preferences i'm not exactly sure about how but but that's that those were some of my thoughts so thank so you. and thank so, you for your paper it's very 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 interesting very good so thank you i i really agree that all of us can change our preferences over time and uh, my grandmother, who who didn't have dementia, um, she she changed her preference in actually a really positive way, which is that in the past she had been kind of quietly racist, and she reflected upon things that happened in her childhood, where she kind of betrayed a close friend who was a, a kind of young black girl, and kind of and realized how bad she felt about that for her whole life, and so she was able to change and, and change in a positive way, and some of the changes. Uh, people with dementia are in positive ways. For instance, people who have been racist now recognize a lot of the people who are taking care of them are kind of people of color and people with accents and people they might have um, uh, you know, dismissed before and they recognize that this actually person is a really wonderful human being. And so sometimes those changes can actually be salutary and kind of in a kind of direction of like, like increased moral awareness. Um, and sometimes they're not, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and sometimes, uh, but I do think that you're right that there's more continuity between um, people who don't have dementia and people who have dementia in that we can change our, our preferences and what matters to us for lots of different reasons. Sometimes it can just be, I'm tired, <laughs> I'm tired of doing this. It takes too much energy. I don't have enough energy anymore. And so I don't want to devote it to this now. And that can be a discovery that someone makes when they are experiencing dementia and when they don't. Um, and I also, I really think I love your example of kind of caregivers finding ways to recognize a person's ca capacities. And that's why I really love the paid caregivers that I was quoting for. They were recognizing, they weren't just saying, oh, the, the people make me feel good. They were saying, mm -hmm. they appreciate, they show gratitude. They see when I'm having a bad day yeah. and want to make me feel better. Um, mm -hmm. and they value that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that ability to do something is so important. And, and that's why it's, it's so terrible when, when paid caregivers have very regimented um, care and they've got two and a half minutes for the bath and whatever. And so they don't have the time to ask someone about their day to notice, you know, something that might be different in the room and so forth. And why, and why they might have a change of preference. Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to um, G Chen next. And then in the chat, there's a comment from Georgina Campelia. So then um, if uh, she wants to uh, present that, that would be great, or I can uh, read it afterwards. But first, we'll go to Ji Chen. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I want to ask a question regarding 
uh, your conclusion that caregivers should not be people with dementia uh, in their second childhood. Because I believe that when we talk about care or caring activities or caring, uh, or caring relationships, the mother and kid or parent and kid caring relationship is uh, still a typical example. And also, I believe that there are some positive contributions to the to that uh, caring relationship when the mother treat the kid as a kid um, in her caring of the kid. So I guess I may want to ask for more clarification on how exactly uh, like treating people with dementia in their childhood undermines their partial autonomy and also probably how your views on uh, how your views uh, is uh, when a mother, when the mother's caring of the kid as a kid undermines the autonomy that you have in mind. And uh, and also because I kind of feel like, especially like when, like like a parent um, treats their kid as like being full of potentials. So I don't see that undermines their autonomy in your uh, view. So yes, that's my question. Yes. So, so I don't think that um, a lot of forms of parental care undermine um, children's autonomy. I actually, in, in my work on children and autonomy, I argue that, for instance, children's commitments and cares for and love for their parents and caregivers can be a source of autonomy for them. So it's not, and I'm not, this is for me not um, an argument about the autonomy of people with dementia. This is for me an argument about, I think it's a little bit, can, can be dismissive to say, they're in their second childhood now and there's behaviors that are okay to do with children like maybe to shush them or to instead of explaining kind of like depending upon their age like oh you need to do that like you know like like pulling up a mask over their face uh rather than um kind of explaining to the person and so this is this is i'm thinking of um two encounters i saw when uh i was taking um someone to get kind of their COVID shot and someone else was taking their elderly mother who had some degree of dementia uh, to get a COVID shot and uh the mother uh was talking loudly and the daughter kept on saying shh like she didn't like say hey this is a bit loud you're she she just she was shushing her and she was pulling off her mask not and i think those are i think and those are the kinds of behaviors that maybe people think are okay with a baby because they're not the baby doesn't feel like they're being disrespected um i still think it's nice for even a, a, like a relatively like so, as soon as the child is verbal to kind of try to use words to explain to them and even maybe before they're verbal to try to use words to explain to them but i i think that if you think that the person that the elderly person who maybe needs help feeding them in the way that you might be feeding a child um is just is in their second childhood then you forget that they know what it's like to eat with other people in a kind of more um in a, in a way that adults do with one another they know what it's like to be respected by adults when you're uh, kind of when when you're all kind of eating your meals and things like that so i'm afraid that thinking of someone as being in their second childhood is too likely to um, kind of encourage failure to recognize that they are someone who has lived through all of these other life stages and know what it's like to be disres disrespected. So um, that would be kind of one of my areas for concern. Also, when someone is, uh, regards someone as kind of being a childhood, they, they might regard them as kind of be like saying like honey, baby, lovey, sweetie, kind of, and, and to some people what dementia really don't want to, to be talked to is if they are a little baby, um, right? So, um, or as if they are a very young child. So there was a there was a kind of piece of advice in the kind of longer version of my paper I talk about from someone she's talking about how to be a dementia capable caregiver and she's saying there's some things you can learn um, from childcare and I do think there are a couple of things you can learn like pronouns can be confusing for children pronouns can sometimes be confusing for people with dementia but she says it's really important but you remember <laughs> that even if there's some things you can learn from childhood that there's a lot that you have to treat someone as an adult and they know what it's like to be treated as a child and cheated as an adult. So um, so those would be, I guess, some of my responses. Okay, Georgina. Hi, thanks so much for this paper. Um, I, I spend part of my time as an ethics consultant in hospitals. Um, and I think that um, I really appreciate this perspective uh, in part because I think it's, um, I mean, it's relatively often the case that we're trying to pull together both right prior autonomously 
express preferences in the traditional sense with in the moment preferences or consistent preferences over time, legal next of kin choices, healthcare professionals recommendations, et cetera. But where we really run into trouble <laughs> is when we don't have a legal next of kin um, mm -hmm. or you know somebody in relationship with the patient to help us navigate um, in this relational sense, right? How did we think about autonomy for the, or agency for this patient um, over time or in the moment? And so in those kinds of contexts, I'm wondering, you know, I think the fallback in healthcare ethics is typically, um, well, we might, we might have prior expressed autonomous preferences that we'll rely on or um, absent that we turn to, you know, beneficence and non-maleficence, right? We're avoiding harm as much as possible. And sometimes uh, we use that, that principle instead of thinking about agency and autonomy to respect um, objections to certain kinds of care or something like that. We're, we're, what we're saying is we're avoiding harm, not we're respecting the patient's choices. And so I, I wondered to what extent you thought like this kind of opens us up to the possibility of actually there are more avenues towards respectfulness and respect for autonomy, mm -hmm. right, in this setting. And then also, um, you know, but, but still, how do we navigate that if there are tensions over the course of a day, right, where the preferences shift over the course of a day or over a week or are in conflict with, you know, prior known express preferences like an upholst or most or something like that so so I mean like it's hard so it's I, I can't all I, I guess I can say is that I think that it's that part of respectful care is if the person is able to still convey um, their preferences and if they if they're strongly held if they have some degree of stability um, like then that's something that should be taken into the kind of deliberation about what to do and I guess I would also say is when there is no um, kind of next of kin or kind of person who's like kind of appointed to be their substitute decision maker that I would say that I, I think um, if there's been continuity of care with respect to paid caregivers, I would I think it could be important to recognize that they might have insights also into because if, if they're spending a lot of regular time with the person, they could say they always are saying that they don't like this or, you know, they change their mind a lot about whether or not they welcome this. Or I've noticed that when they're very tired, they don't want that. Like, so I think that, I think that too often we think, oh, paid caregivers, how, why would they be included in this discussion? But I do think that they could sometimes help fill in some of those gaps about to what extent does the person have some things that are relatively stable that matter to them a lot. Okay, so... We have an, a couple, a few more comments in the chat here. Um, let's see. I know Dale had to log off. He um, commented that taste often changes with dementia, which can shape present desires. I appreciate considering current desires in people with dementia because in doing so, we are honoring the person's embodiment framed by their present body mind. Okay. And Monique, I think, is still here. She had um, added to the chat as well. So we, oh good, we have time for a few more questions, at least uh, two more. So Daniel, you're, you're up next. Thanks, yeah. So I, I've had this question since uh, I um, asked my earlier question and then it kind of follows from G's question a little, just a, just a bit ago about um, uh, difference with children. Just like I'm trying to lower my hand. Okay, there we go. Um, uh, and and uh, I, I guess I just want to ask about the uh, truthfulness um, because when I asked my my earlier question, you bought you brought up the idea of you know kind of like a fake fake meat you know <laughs> fake meat meatballs or uh, you know uh, uh, substitute meat hamburgers or whatever you want to do. Um, and it does it does seem to me that. Um, uh, that when you're trying to maybe balance, uh, you know, this pres the the person's present um, uh, choices somewhat with with you know their past choices, it will lend itself to caregivers making some kind of compromise choices that could very easily lead to these sorts of uh, deceptive practices. Like, well, well, you know. Um, 
we'll do this, we'll do what they, you know, they're requesting while respecting what they did before. So we'll kind of half do it or we'll tell them we did it, but we won't really do it. Uh, all of which sounds very paternalistic. Um, so in that sense, uh, even though, you know, you're saying you're, you're making this differentiation, uh, there's a kind of uh, paternalism that I think could easily creep in uh, with this kind of perspective. So I just wanted to see, see like, you know, what is the value of truthfulness in, in this? And, and is there that, that kind of concern? So, so I, I actually think in those circumstances, it's pretty important to be truthful, but I also think that, so sometimes like people with dementia will forget that someone they love has died. And if you're really truthful when they ask where they are or why they haven't been to see them, you would need to remind them every time you saw them that this person has died. And um, that can be really difficult. And I can understand why people think, I don't want every encounter I have <laughs> with this person to be one where they are grieving this loss all over again. Um, and so I understand a kind of a dodgy, they couldn't come right now kind of response. And if the person persists, then I would think that it could be useful to find a way of kind of leaving a reminder for them about um, that the person that they love has died. Um, because you don't, because I think it's 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 appropriate for them to come to terms with that, to know that, to not feel like they're abandoned by the person who's died, who isn't coming to see them. But I also think that you don't necessarily want every visit <laughs> to be dominated by that again. So I would always err in favor of trying to be truthful with the person, but I guess I would understand that sometimes it can take a long time to convey a truth um, and to convey it in a kind of thoughtful and caring way. And and you what, so you don't maybe ne always have to answer every question of that nature by kind of bringing up something incredibly difficult that the person has to come to terms with. Um, but for I wasn't imagining with the with the meatballs. I was imagining that Oscar could be in on it and say, "We're everyone's going to have meatballs. Some people are going to have pork meatballs, and some people are going to have beef meatballs, and some people are going to have vegan meatballs, and you're all going to have meatballs, and you can all put the same sauce on them." You know, I wasn't imagining tricking him with that. Um, I was trying to make it kind of make him feel more like he's eating the same kind of thing that other people were. Uh, so like deception can sometimes be necessary, especially when it can take a long time. It can be very diff difficult to convey some kind of hard truth. But um, uh, I would think uh, I, I would err on the side of kind of honesty about, about big matters. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask my um, second question. And then I see that Naomi has uh, her hand up as well. So, okay, so the second question is also... Um, uh, kind of applying pressure, you know, to the view to uh, uh, better uh, understand it. And I'm wondering if the view undervalues the person's long, the person with dementia's long-term relationships. So, you know, and this is connected to the, I mean, connected to the other uh, question about about the person's care view, about um, the uh, weight of their present, you know, their present cares. So, and I, you know, and so to kind of um, flesh out the objection, you know, we can think about cases where someone has had, you know, a 40-year relationship with someone and um, they have shared history, they have shared understandings, they've had a shared life. And if this person, um, if the person with dementia, then, you um, develops a relationship with someone else that's kind of replacing that one. Um, it seems like, you know, on relational self views, like you would still want to give priority to that long-term relationship. And like, even, even for pragmatic reasons for the person with dementia, there might be more of a like light, a sort of um, cares and needs protective role that that long-term relationship would play, but also I think it would do a lot of harm, of course, to the person, you know, to say the spouse in that relationship, um, if we prioritized the um, the person's present cares. And so how do you, how do you analyze that in terms of, you know, the harm that's done to each member of that uh, relationship when we're really, really embracing the person's care views, emphasis on um, the current cares of the person with dementia. So, 
So what I guess what I would do is I would just try to um, if have reminders of that person and the importance in their life, um, like available, like photos available of them. Um, if that person is unable to spend much time with the kind of person in the care home, it may be because it's like you know, like COVID and they weren't able to visit, or maybe they have their own health needs and it's difficult for them to kind of visit, then finding ways of allowing that relationship to continue so that it will continue to matter to the person with dementia. Um, but uh, if if you try that, if you try to reminders of the role that the person has had in the past, if you try to continue to foster that relationship and the person doesn't want to have that relationship anymore, um, I think at some point you'd have to recognize this is not this is not someone that they still care about. And as Eva Kate said, we, we can change our minds and people can end long marriages. Um, right and long and long relationships, whether or not they have dementia, and so it's possible that the person just kind of that they don't meet their needs anymore. Maybe they find it difficult because the person from their past expects them to be like they were in the past, and they feel frustrated because they can't be that person. Um, so I think you, you would you would want to know a little bit more about. Um, how to support that relationship, whether it actually still is valuable to the person with dementia. Um, uh, and um, uh, and like those would be kind of ways of kind of trying to uh, recognize something that did mean a lot to them in the past. And then there is that entirely different strategic thing of like this person could advocate for their interests, right? In the way that maybe another person with dementia in their care home won't be able to do. Um, but I guess you would have to also worry, given that we know that kind of family caregivers project their preferences very much onto their partners who have dementia, um, the way that they advocate for their interests may not actually be something that's congenial to the person with dementia in the present. So it's a, it's a complicated and messy thing. And I definitely think that long-term relationships are worth trying to preserve um, often, <laughs> but not always. Um, Thank and you. Um, thanks. Um, okay, so I know uh, Naomi's hand was up, but now it's it's um, not up. So let's go to Monique, and then um, and uh, then if there's time, Naomi can ask her question. Okay, no, it's just a point. Um, so I have a fair amount of experience of uh, nursing homes, uh, so the situation might be a bit different than somebody uh, who is uh, living at home. Uh, but in terms of relationships, yeah, often individuals will form new relationships and it might actually be fine with the spouse um, who's at home, um, but it might create also problems with children. Uh, so it becomes very complicated. And of course, is the issue of, of consent uh, is this new relationship consensual and so on? But one can understand it because in you know in nursing home people are living together, so they're there, and so the spouse who's at home is you know in that case can't can't visit that often or is not there every night and so on. So that that is a, a really uh, it's become a, a a much discussed issue on. Um, in ethics committees, actually. So I just wanted to note that. Um, the other point was uh, what Eva was mentioning is that people change their minds. And certainly in Canada, the discussion of advanced directives for uh, medical assistance in dying. And one physician said, you know, if, if you, you're, uh, you know, evaluate as having lost capacity, um, and and you had that advanced directive, but you change your mind, changing your mind is not recognized. And so he brought that up as being a real issue. Uh, and, and that is indeed, uh, you know, a concern, which is not that much discussed, actually. And I think it is in part um, because we have such a way of devaluing persons with dementia. And, you know, Amy, you talked about, you know, childhood. But I've heard um, healthcare practitioners saying, oh, so-and-so is just a shadow of their former self, right? Mm -hmm. You're an empty shell. Um, your, your core self is gone. And obviously that's problematic. 
Yeah. So, so the only thing I want to say in response there um, to you, Monique, is that I think Rebecca, Ku or, sorry, no longer, Quill Kukla. Quill Kukla has done work on kind of sexual consent. And uh, one of their core examples involves kind of elderly people who might have some degree of, of dementia. Um, and, sh and she kind of tries to say that we should treat it on a continuum with other kinds of forms of consent, none of which are perfect. Um, and how if we try to forbid people from kind of making these, con these connections, then they're also not going to be protected if actually encounter turns violent because they're going to have to conduct it secretly. So I just uh, think that their work is actually um, potentially really relevant for thinking that of the, the issue of kind of consent um, when for consent to sex with people in dementia. And sorry for the Rebecca thing. Ugh. And that's how I met them, but the quill, quill, quill. Okay, so are there any final questions? Naomi, did you want to, um, oh, Joan, oh, I see. Uh, Joan has a question. So Joan will have the last question and then, we, then we'll be out of time. This is more a comment than a question. Thank you, Amy, so much for this paper. It's really wonderful. I mean, I have a deep question about why you want to insist that personhood and autonomy are different things, but that's probably a three hour lecture. So we'll leave that one. The other thing I want to point out in the paper, though, that no one else has remarked about that I think is really important is how, how useful and important it is to consult the people who we're talking about when we're talking about them. And you, you made that point in the paper. The next step, of course, is even as we're framing the research we want to do, make them co-participants in organizing how the research is conducted. I'm sure you've given that some thought, so maybe you could just speak about it. Yeah, so um, so I, I'm I'm not capable of doing um, this this kind of social science research myself, but I so all, all I can do is seek out people who are in, doing this, and I find the most valuable work for me was when um, people with dementia were um, not only. Um, kind of respected participants, but co-designers of the work as well. And I, I definitely see work going in that direction. Um, and also, I just want to kind of give a shout out to that something called the Dementia Friends Initiative, which is uh, teaching uh, medical school students and nursing students and social work students about the kind of continuing capacities as well as the needs of people with dementia. And it's been shown that it has really productive and that the, the students who are learning about this um, kind of have new, uh, new desires to kind of develop programs and work with people with dementia in respectful ways. So, so it's not directly, that's not about research, but that's about kind of the, the, the kind of teaching the people who will be having encounters with them in the future, how to kind of engage with them more respectfully. And I, I regard that as continuous with, and also a really wonderful development as well as involving people with dementia in designing as well as conducting the research. So I wanna thank everyone so much for your time and attention. Um, uh, this is like, as I said, a bit of a swerve for me. And so I was a little nervous about, about, uh, about it. I'm, I'm more confident uh, kind of in my work about children and autonomy than I have been in this. And, uh, and thank you, Joan, I will think more. And I felt like I need to say maybe a little bit more about why um, I don't think it's more the best ways to kind of think about autonomy. And it's partly a little bit strategic and that I think that there's so many clear signs that a person isn't going to be a typical model of autonomy, even less so than a child. Um, and partly because I think that even if someone isn't able to direct their life anymore, when they still have things that matter to them, that should just be full moral status right there. And we don't have to look for proof of ability to, to direct one's life. Well, thank you, Amy. This is such a really rich project and um, a really important uh, paper. So anyone who wants to send me feedback, I would love that. So, so thank you all so much for your attention. I know it's greedy to ask for even more feedback, but uh, if anyone is inclined, I would welcome it. Thanks. All right. And our next care forum meeting will be, let's see, Daniel, you probably have the information. Monique Renoir is right way here with us on November 17th. And uh, we'll be, uh, I'll send out an announcement for that in a couple weeks along with uh, Monique's paper. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. See you in a few weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.